you guys, how are you? Miss Christensen here. I have picked a really great chapter book that I'd like to share with you upper graders. It's a book that's called Closed for the Season. It's filled with adventure and it's scary and it's suspenseful and there's twists and turns. I think you guys will love it. So if you'd like to join me, find a spot, get comfortable, sit down, relax. You can read with me or you can just listen, whatever you like to do. Chapter One by the time Dad pulled into the driveway of our new house, all I wanted was to go inside and jump in the shower, if we had a shower, that is, or even any water. Dad had warned us the house needed a lot of work, but the place was in worse shape than I'd imagined. Old and run down, paint peeling and flaking, a broken downspout dangling from the eaves, old papers littering the porch, the grass was at least two feet high, choked with towering thistles and milkweed. The bushes and trees had a wild, shaggy look. Mom, who described it as a quaint Victorian cottage with tons of potential, grew strangely quiet at the sight of it. Dad took one look, sighed, and opened the car door. It seems the realtor forgot to have someone mow the lawn. He shook his head and sighed again. It's a good thing I don't start teaching until fall. We have some time to get this place in shape. Please don't tell me this is our house, I said to Mom. We aren't really going to live here. It's Dad's idea of a joke, right? Making a big effort to infuse her voice with enthusiasm, Mom said, For heaven's sake, Logan, wait till it's painted and the lawn's cut. It will be adorable. With a cynical sigh, I followed my parents toward the front door. A black mutt about the size of a German shepherd watched us from the porch. Mom edged behind Dad, but there was no need to be scared. The dog got to his feet and wagged his tail as if he was greeting old friends. Does he come with the house, I asked. Mom eyed the dog as if she suspected his friendliness was an act. I think he belongs to the people next door. As if on cue, a boy appeared at the hedge, separating his yard from ours. His name's Bear, he said, part Rottweiler, part Lab. He used to belong to the lady who lived in your house, but now he's mine and Grandma's. The boy and I stared at each other over the low hedge. He was shorter than I was, younger too, probably no more than eleven. His straight yellow hair hung in his eyes and straggled down the back of his neck. His glasses were held together with tape, and he wore a faded t-shirt big enough for Dad that said, Menzer's Hardware. If we don't have it, you don't need it. I've been waiting all day for you, the boy frowned as if he'd expected me to apologize for inconveniencing him. Grandma was sure you'd be here by noon, and it's almost six o'clock. He held up a skinny arm to show me the time on an enormous watch that was way too big for his bony wrist. I'd been trapped in the back seat of an unair conditioned car for almost two hours. The temperature was over 90. I was hot, I was tired, I was in a really bad mood. I definitely did not feel like being friendly, especially with such a weird looking kid. My name's Arthur Jenkins, the boy went on. What's yours? Logan Forbes. I glanced over my shoulder, hoping to see Mom or Dad beckoning me to come inside and help unpack or something, but no one was in sight. Now, if I'd wanted to stay outside and talk to Arthur Jenkins, you can bet my parents would have been hollering at me to get my butt in the house. How old are you? Arthur asked. Without giving me a chance to answer, he said, I'm almost 12. Next fall, I'll be in sixth grade at Oakview Middle School. 
you can't really see any oaks from there because they cut them all down to build a bunch of big expensive houses. Fair oaks, it's called, in memory of the trees, I guess. Mostly everyone our age lives there. They're all snobs. I turned 13 last month, I said. I'll be in seventh grade, a whole year ahead of you. Arthur shrugged. We can be friends anyway. Living so close, that's propinquity. He paused to see if I knew what propinquity meant. In case I didn't, he added, that means proximity or nearness, also kinship and similarity in nature. He flashed a crooked grin. I have the biggest vocabulary in my grade. I'm also the best speller and the best reader. I read 503 books for last year's readathon, not Dr. Seuss either. Thick ones like Harry Potter books. I won so much free pizza, I don't even like the way it smells anymore. While Arthur bragged, I looked longingly at the house. I could hear Dad hammering, but no one came to the door to call me inside. Arthur pulled a stick of gum out of his pocket. Without offering me any, he stuffed it in his mouth. I watched him chew with lip-smacking relish, blow a big bubble, and suck it slowly back inside his mouth. When he was ready to talk again, he said, You've got some nice furniture. Expensive, Grandma says. We watched the moving men carry it in yesterday. How big is your TV screen? I've never seen one that size except in a store down at Peckham Mall. I shrugged and glanced at the house, still hoping someone would rescue me from Arthur. Grandma and I didn't think anybody was ever going to buy old Mrs. Donaldson's place, Arthur went on. It's been empty for almost three years. I guess the real estate company was hoping some folks from out of town like you all would buy it without knowing what happened in it. He paused to blow another bubble. What do you mean? I asked, curious in spite of myself. What happened in our house? He leaned across the hedge, his face so close I could smell his gum. Mrs. Donaldson died there. She was murdered. Murdered? I stared at Arthur, shocked. No way. Ask Grandma. She's the one who found her. His eyes widened behind the smeared lenses of his glasses. In a low voice, he went on with what I hoped was a story he'd concocted to scare me. One night, Bear woke up Grandma and me barking like he'd gone crazy or something. We both kept hoping he'd shut up so we could go back to sleep, but he didn't stop. Finally, Grandma went downstairs and I followed her. Bear was at our back door making a horrible fuss. Arthur paused and glanced at the dog who'd raised his head at the mention of his name. Mrs. Donaldson never let him out unless he was on a leash, Arthur went on. Not only that, his head was bleeding like somebody had whacked him hard enough to kill an ordinary dog. He paused again, and I found myself staring at Bear, who was now scratching his ear. Arthur sighed. Grandma and I knew something was wrong. It was one of those weird feelings. You know what I mean? I nodded, like in a movie when the music gets scary and you can tell something bad is going to happen. Exactly. Arthur crossed his arms across his skinny chest and took a deep breath. Grandma told me to stay inside while she ran to Mrs. Donaldson's house. The back door was wide open, and the kitchen was a wreck. Drawers emptied out, stuff strewn everywhere, furniture turned over. Bear ran down the cellar steps whining and crying, and Grandma followed him. Mrs. Donaldson was lying on the floor, dead. Despite the warm summer sun, goosebumps raced up and down my arms, Maybe she just fell down the steps. Maybe even the police said it was murder, Arthur interrupted. Somebody broke in and killed her. Then they tore the whole house apart. Not just the kitchen, but every room, including the attic. They were looking for money, I guess. I glanced at Bear, who'd gone back to sleep on our porch. Is he really her dog? Mrs. Donaldson loved that dog, and he loved her. He must have done his best to protect her. But, Arthur shrugged, the cops were going to take him to the pound, but Grandma said we'd keep him. 
The sad thing is, he spends more time at your house than ours. I guess he's hoping Mrs. Donaldson will come back some day. While Arthur talked, I found myself staring at my new home. Before I'd learned its gruesome secret, it had seemed like an ordinary little house, kind of homely and run down. Now it had a sinister look, as if it were hiding behind the overgrown trees and bushes, keeping dark, scary secrets. Our back door opened then, and Mom leaned out. Logan, how about giving us some help in here? At the same moment, a woman appeared on Arthur's porch. Like him, she was skinny as a stick. Her hair was blonde or white, I wasn't sure which, and it stuck up like a cockatoo's crest. Her eyebrows were black, drawn on a little too high, which gave her face a startled look. I didn't have any idea how old she was, Anywhere from middle age to ancient was the closest I could guess. Hello there, she called to me. Welcome to Billsville. I'm Arthur's granny, Darla Jenkins. Tell your folks I'll come on over for a visit after they get settled. To Arthur, she said, dinner's ready, Artie. Come in and wash up. See you later. Without another word, Arthur ran to his house, which was smaller and in worse need of paint than ours. Taking the sagging steps two at a time, he yanked open the screen door and disappeared. In the sudden silence, I heard his grandmother say, Arthur Jenkins, how often must I tell you not to slam that door? I headed for our house, eager to confront mom and dad with the truth about our new home. Chapter Two as I entered the kitchen, I blurted out, Why didn't you tell me the old woman who used to live in this house was murdered here? Mom looked up from the pots and pans she was trying to organize. What are you talking about? Who told you that? Dad asked at the same time. The boy next door, Arthur. His grandmother found the body down there. I pointed to the cellar door at the bottom of the steps. Mrs. Donaldson did die of a fall down those steps, Dad said slowly, but she wasn't murdered, Logan. We thought it might worry you to know someone died here, Mom put in. We should have known you'd hear it from somebody else, with embellishments. Worry me, I repeated. It's bad enough she died, but she was murdered, Mom. K-I-L-L-E-D. That definitely worries me. She wasn't, Mom began, but the doorbell interrupted her. That must be the pizza I ordered, Dad said. We followed him to the front door, and sure enough, a guy holding a pizza box stood on the porch. While Dad went through the business end of the delivery, the pizza guy said, I'm glad to see somebody's finally moved into poor old Mrs. Donaldson's house. It's been empty for a long time. I guess it was hard to sell considering what happened. Yes, the place has really been neglected, Dad broke in before the delivery guy could finish. I've got my work cut out for me. If you need any help, just let me know, the pizza guy said. My name's Johnny O'Neill. He scribbled something on a card from the pizza place and handed it to Dad. Here's my phone number. I work nights at Golden Joe's Pizza Go Go, so I'm free in the daytime. How are you with a lawnmower, Dad gestured at the weedy yard. No problem, Johnny answered. I can cut the grass tomorrow if you like. Twenty dollars, front and back, guaranteed neat job. I used to do it for Mrs. Donaldson before. Great, Dad grinned. How about 10 a.m.? It's a deal. We watched Johnny run to his car, which sported a big pizza sign on the roof, and drive away fast. No doubt some hungry family was wondering where their pizza was. Why do you think Johnny said poor old Mrs. Donaldson? I asked Mom. She handed me a slice of pizza loaded with all the things I love. Mushrooms, sausage, pepperoni, and extra cheese, and shrugged. Probably because she died, Logan. Turning to Dad, she said, did you notice his tattoos? Really professional work, Dad said, totally missing the tone of disapproval in Mom's voice. The detail, the color, the intricacy. He'll be sorry when he's older, Mom interrupted. 
Giving me a sharp look, she added, I hear it's a very painful and expensive process to have tattoos removed. I'd been thinking Johnny's tattoos were pretty cool, but I decided to keep that thought to myself. I hope he shows up tomorrow, Mom went on to Dad. He doesn't look like the responsible type. His mouth full of pizza, Dad simply shrugged. Just as I'd helped myself to the last slice, I heard a footstep in the kitchen. I whirled around, half expecting to see Mrs. Donaldson's ghost, but it was only Arthur standing in the dining room doorway holding a cake. My grandmother sent this to welcome you, he told Mom. It's devil's food with chocolate icing, the best you ever ate. She'd have brought it herself, but her hips bothering her. Since Arthur was practically drooling, Mom invited him to join us for dessert. In one second, he was sitting beside me, holding a fork, watching Mom cut into the cake. Don't tell Grandma, he said. I'm not supposed to have any. She told me it's all for you. Your secret's safe with us. Mom handed Arthur the first piece, intending him to pass it to Dad, but he kept it for himself. Before Mom had the second slice cut, Arthur had his mouth full. I guess the word etiquette and its definition were missing from his enormous vocabulary. As we ate, we learned more about our house than we wanted to know. According to Arthur's grandma, the backyard flooded every time it rained. The roof was in bad shape and no doubt leaked, and the porch suffered from dry rot. Termites, too, most likely, Arthur said gloomily. Mrs. Donaldson was getting too old to keep up with the repairs. Grandma says the place is about to fall down. Dad smiled a little stiffly. We had the house looked at before we moved in, Arthur. The inspector gave it a clean bill of health. Was it Mr. Lacey? When Dad nodded, Arthur looked glum. Grandma says Errol G. Lacey would rather stand outside in the rain and lie than come in the house and tell the truth. He is positively and absolutely mendacious. She wouldn't trust him as far as she can throw him, which isn't very far because he must weigh at least 300 pounds stark naked. Mom flashed a worried look at Dad, but he was studying our neighbor as if he were an unknown species. Unaware of Dad's scrutiny, Arthur accepted another piece of cake and lit into it with relish. I saw Johnny O'Neill deliver a pizza to your house, he said through a mouthful of crumbs. I bet it was cold. He always stops and talks to people. Grandma doesn't know how Joe stays in business with Johnny doing the deliveries. Must be lots of folks like cold pizza. He paused to lick the icing off his fingers. I guess it's because Johnny is Joe's nephew. Plus, Golden Joe's is the only pizza place in town. Not that I'd ever eat there. The health department's after Joe big time. Roaches in the kitchen, rats. Seeing that mom was turning greenish, dad cut into Arthur's monologue. What's this story you told Logan about Mrs. Donaldson being murdered? It's true, Arthur replied. Ask anybody. Someone broke in and pushed her down the steps. They almost killed her dog too. Then they ransacked the house. Mom glanced at the closed cellar door. The real estate agent told us Mrs. Donaldson died of falling down the steps, she said, but she didn't say anything about murder. Mrs. DeSilvio didn't tell you an out-and-out -out lie, Arthur said with a shrug. She just left out a few details. I'm disappointed in her, Mom said. Rhoda and I, I warned you not to think of that woman as a friend, Dad interrupted. Rhoda's a real estate agent. She wanted to sell us the house, pure and simple. Well, if she'd told us the whole truth, I wouldn't have bought the place, Mom said. And that's exactly why she didn't. Dad picked up the empty pizza box and headed toward the kitchen. Let's get cleaned up. We've had a big day, and I, for one, would like to go to bed early. Did they catch the killer? Mom asked Arthur. He shook his head. Grandma thinks he's still in town. Most likely he'll strike again. You know, like those serial killers you hear about. Just then, the shrill sound of a police whistle shattered the evening. Mom gasped in alarm, and I choked on a mouthful of cake. Don't worry, Arthur said. 
That's grandma calling me. Gotta go. At the kitchen door, he turned and grinned at me. I'll show you the sights tomorrow, which will take about one minute. Then we can go to the library. As soon as the screen door slammed shut, mom and dad looked at me as if I'd invented Arthur to make their lives miserable. It's not my fault, I said. He was lying in wait for me. Later that night, as I was getting ready for bed, I found myself hoping Arthur was right about the termites. The sooner the house fell down, the sooner we'd move to a nice house in Fair Oaks where no one had been murdered. I'd leave Arthur behind and make new friends. Just because I'd been a nerd in Richmond didn't mean I had to be a nerd here. I could start over learn some sports, get better looking clothes, and say the right thing instead of something dumb. Chapter 3 The next morning, Arthur walked into the kitchen while I was eating breakfast. Without waiting for an invitation, he dipped his hand into the Raisin Bran box and scooped out a helping. I watched him dump the cereal into his mouth and chew it up. Would you like a bowl? I asked, hoping to sound sarcastic. No, I already had breakfast. We get the store brand of Raisin Bran. I was just seeing which tasted better. And? I like the store brand, Arthur said. It's a better buy, too. Mom took a break from unpacking to poke her head into the kitchen. Good morning, Arthur. Did you tell your grandmother how much we enjoyed the cake? He nodded. She was tickled pink, he said with a crooked grin. I bet you never guessed she bought that cake at the day-old bake shop. Mom and I looked at each other. It was true. We hadn't guessed. Well, Mom said, returning Arthur's grin. I'll have to ask your grandmother where that shop is the next time I need cake. It's in the shopping center on Route 23, Arthur said, right next to the adult video place. Mom ignored the part about the video store. What are you two planning to do today? I groaned silently. We'd been here less than 24 hours and Mom was already referring to Arthur and me as you two. I'm going to show Logan the town, Arthur said, scooping up another handful of raisin bran. Mom ignored that too. Behave yourself, she said, and be back in time for lunch. I followed Arthur outside and nearly tripped over Bear, who was lying near the door. He raised his head and looked at me, then sighed and began scratching his side. Poor fella, Arthur said. He really loved Mrs. Donaldson. I wish Mom and Dad hadn't bought this house, I said. Well, I'm glad they did, Arthur said. It's nice having someone to hang out with. I don't have a lot of friends, you know. That was no surprise, but I didn't tell him that. Even if we didn't move to Fair Oaks before school started, I'd make new friends anyway. I wasn't about to spend the rest of my life stuck with a weird kid like Arthur. An ancient girl's three-speed Raleigh with a big straw basket attached to its handlebars leaned against the porch. I'd have rather walked than ride something that clunky. But Arthur straddled it and grinned. Come on, he said. I'll show you the spectacular sights of Bealsville. I went to the garage and wheeled out my bike, a red trek with more gears than I knew what to do with, and brakes quick enough to pitch me over the handlebars. Dad had bought new bikes for all three of us. Now that we were living near the mountains, he planned for us to do a lot of riding on the park trails. That sure is one fancy bike. But you know what? Arthur patted the Raleigh's handlebars. This is the best bike ever made. It's a genuine classic. Dad came to the kitchen door. Don't forget your helmet, Logan. He tossed it to me from the back porch. Arthur watched me fasten the strap under my chin. Do you have fancy spandex shorts too, he asked, and special shoes that snap to the pedals? I shook my head, irritated by the sarcastic edge to his questions. Where's your helmet? I asked. Grandma says helmets take all the fun out of bike riding. If you're under 18, you have to wear one. It's the law. Arthur shrugged. Grandma says the cops have more important things to do than to arrest kids for not wearing helmets. 
Your grandmother sure has a lot of opinions. You can say that again. Arthur pushed off and wobbled down the driveway toward the street. If any kid needed protection, he did. Hey, I called. I bet dad can lend you a helmet. Arthur shook his head. I don't need it. I followed him down the shady street, glad to see he was doing better now that he was pedaling faster. True to his word, it didn't take long to tour Billsville proper. We cruised up and down a few hilly streets. Arthur pointed out various houses. The police chief lived in a brick rambler at the end of Albert Street. The principal of the middle school lived in a huge Victorian at the top of the hill on Magruder Road. A doctor lived in another mansion across the way. A dentist was close by in a tidy brick colonial on Sheraton Street. His fence was made of a row of wooden teeth complete with a sign that said Toothacre. I hoped he wasn't the only dentist in town. How come so many houses have those signs in their yards? I pointed to a bunch sprouting like mushrooms on the dentist's lawn. One said, save the magic. Another said, say no to Chestnut Manor Estates. Arthur screwed up his face in disgust. Lots of people want to save the old amusement park out on Route 23, the Magic Forest it was called. After it closed, some corporation bought the land, got it cheap according to Grandma. They plan to tear down what's left of the place and build a big development there. More huge houses like the ones in Fair Oaks, plus an outlet mall, a bunch of restaurants, and a multiplex movie theater. That doesn't sound so bad, Arthur shrugged. People here like things the way they are. They don't want Bealesville to become a suburb of Richmond. Maneuvering around a parked car, he added, The Magic Forest is a really neat place. It's all grown over with vines and stuff, and the rides and buildings are falling down. Somebody could film a great horror movie there. With that, Arthur pedaled down Tulip Road, picking up speed as he coasted to Main Street at the bottom of the hill. The biggest house was Bradley's Funeral Home, which had provided fine service for 75 years according to the sign in the front yard. Next to Bradley's establishment was the Quiet Hours Nursing Home, which I guessed was a convenient arrangement considering that the cemetery was directly across the street. Some old folks were sitting in rockers on the front porch, gazing at the green grass and marble headstones. Maybe that's what you did when you were their age, contemplated your eternal resting place. Maybe it helped you get used to the idea of dying, but I doubted it. That's where Mrs. Donaldson's funeral was. Arthur pointed to Bradley's. Lots of people came. So many, they had to get in line and wait to go in. Fire laws, you know. He swerved to avoid hitting a fire hydrant he hadn't noticed. Most of them didn't even know her, he went on, as if he hadn't just missed fracturing his skull. They went because she was murdered. Did you go? Of course, she was a nice old lady. He paused to watch a dog dash across the street in pursuit of a cat. I looked at Arthur with admiration maybe even envy. I'd never been to a funeral, not even my grandparents or my favorite aunts. Mom thought I was too young to be exposed to such things. But I felt as if I'd missed out on something. Every kid I knew had been to at least one funeral. Let's get moving. Arthur took off down another steep hill and I pedaled after him hoping to see the rest of the town before he killed himself in a spectacular bike crash.